Thank you for this opportunity to present at IEDM. My name is Walter van der Weengaard. I am a professor in micro nanosystems, and specifically my research focuses on microfluidics. However, here I will only talk about my work related to nanostructuring and specifically biohybrid nanostructuring. I will talk about three different types of technologies we've developed during the past couple of years in my lab. The first is to create gold nanowires based on DNA. The second is to nanostructure uh, synthetic polymers and combine them with biologic material. And the third is the nanostructuring of biologic material itself, uh, spider silk. Our work on DNA templated gold nanowires started from the desire to detect, electrically detect DNA, uh, low abundant DNA in a droplet of liquid. To be able to do that, we need to uh, face three challenges. The first one is to actually find low abundant DNA in a large volume. The second is to be able to hold these short strands of DNA, which are typically 50 nanometers on both ends. And the third is to actually measure the electrical properties of the DNA because the DNA is not electrically conductive. How to do that is that we started from a thin uh, polycarbonate membrane, only 10 micrometer thick, and we buy this commercially, and this, uh, mem these membranes have already pre-etched holes of one or two micrometer track etched. Um, and the first thing we do is to coat this membrane with gold on both sides. And then we uh, functionalize one side with tile oligo probes that are complementary to the DNA we try to detect. Adding the sample, the sample will actually bind to the probes, and it does that in a circular fashion. So after a ligation, we create a circularized piece of DNA. And if we now uh, amplify this DNA in a so-called rolling circle amplification, we create a concatenation of this DNA. So we make copy, 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 copy every time the polymerase makes a circle. So we make long copies, for example, a 50 nanometer strand is turned into a 50 micrometer long strand of DNA. This DNA can be pulled to the pores, and we do that by draining the water through the membrane. And what happens is that the DNA likes to be in the liquid rather than to be in the air. So the liquid air interface will pull the DNA to the pore so that we get a stretch DNA from one side of the membrane to the other side. Still, we can't measure anything because the DNA is not conductive. But what we can do is now already visualize this DNA. For example, we can add fluorescent probes. And here you can see um, uh, microscopy images, um, confocal microscopy images. Uh, where we see, for example, how this is through the, through the pores, we see through every pore, we see a green fluorescent wire going through. Instead of putting the fluorescent probe, we can actually also put gold nanoparticles um, and bind those. And what we then create is a protein of gold nanoparticles. And these gold nanoparticles, we can then connect to one another to form gold nanowires. And now we have turned our 50 nanometer strand DNA from the inside the liquid we convert it to a 50 micrometer strand that now connects one side of the membrane to the other in the form of a gold nanowire. You can see this visualized here. This is a SEM image where you see one, two, three different nanowires going from on the surface to, uh, to a hole and going through it. Uh, of course, we can't see the DNA underneath. Now we can measure the conductivity and we do that by measuring that over the membrane. And now we can measure the electrical resistance and it will drop typically from unmeasurable resistance, so maybe giga ohm open circuit to something as low as 10 to 20 ohms when we have a nanowire going through. And we not do that just over the surface, we do this in a smart way. So we have here, in this case, for example, we have one, two, three of these membranes that we have coded with gold, but we have patterned the gold on forehand. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different wells with a little bit of membrane inside that is covered with gold and they're pre-contacted already. And now what we can do is we can put a droplet over this entire structure and we can measure in six wells at the same time. So we get a digital assay and now we can count how many of the wells become positive. That means we can measure the electrical resistance. And we can do that uh, several times. So we have done this in, uh, uh, in quadruplets per, the, per uh, concentration. And we see we can detect uh, DNA as low with an abundance as low as 790 zeptomolar. So that is the low atom. So we have nanomolar, picomolar, femtomolar, octomolar, zeptomolar. And this concentration is so low that actually in the 50 microliter droplets that we add, typically we should have about 30 molecules of DNA and those we can detect electrically. 
This work has been published in two papers and you can find the details here. The second part of my talk deals with the nanostructuring of synthetic polymers. We work or we developed in our lab a novel polymer that is called off stoichiometric thiolene, or in short, OSTE. What is OSTE? It's a thiolene polymer, which means you have thiol groups and you have ene groups. And thiols and enes, they will uh, re readily react if you bring them together with a minimal, a minimal amount of energy. So if you bring them together, uh, monomers of both, and you cross-link them, you get a thiolene polymer. The speciality that we do is that we do this wrong. And with that, I mean, we instead of putting the, the same amount of enes and tiles in a mixture, we're going to either put too many enes or too many tiles. Here, for example, we see what happens. If we have too many tiles, then we still get a cross-linking. We get a solid polymer. However, the surface of the polymer has an excess of tile, layer, uh, of tile groups. And so we have a solid polymer with a reactive surface. And that is why this is so, in so interesting, because a reactive surface you can do biochemistry immediately without surface and without needing to surface activate. You can bind DNA or protein, and you will be able to bond this uh, polymer at room temperature without glue, spontaneously. And so we show that uh, we can have a superior surface control here. For example, you can see we can make this hydrophilic or hydrophobic or bond poly or bond pr uh, probes to it. We can structure it in a number of ways, which I'm going to show soon. We can use backbones that are either very stiff or very flexible. And of course, we can do this room temperature unassisted bonding. This polymer has been commercialized. Uh, we, had this, we have a startup company called Mercine Labs. You can find them on ostomers.com and you can buy this polymer to test it out in your own lab. I'm going to talk about the structuring of this polymer, of structuring of OST, and more specifically of the nanostructuring aspects of it. E so we have tuned the polymer to be able to use it for e-beam lithography, for nano imprint lithography, and for injection molding. For e-beam lithography, what we do is that we spin a very thin layer of the polymer, typically 50 to 100 nanometer, uh, and then we do a direct e-beam writing of the polymer. So we get a structured layer of the polymer, and the polymer is not only structured, it's also, it has this uh, um, excess tile groups. Now, this axial tile groups we can use without further surface chemistry. We can spontaneously bond biotin groups to it. And then on the biotin group, we can bind the streptovidin group. So we can, for example, bind proteins in this way directly onto the uh, polymer. This is how the structure looks like. You can see we have very nicely resolved structures uh, with features from 500 nanometer all the way down to 20 nanometers. Uh, and here you see how these look like after we coat them with a the fluorescent polymer. And you can see, for example, the fractal tree has a stem of 100 micrometer, but the leaves go down to, 20, to 200 nanometer in this case. And here I want to focus, for example, this line pattern here on the right bottom, which are lines that are only 250 nanometer wide, these lines. But still, you can nicely see how they are covered with, um, with fluorescent polymer. A uh, fluorescent, sorry, fluorescent uh, protein. Uh, when it comes to the nano imprint lithography and the uh, nano reaction injection molding, um, here we make use of the very nice properties of the OSTE polymer that it has a delayed gelation. That means that when the tiles and the enes start bonding to each other and, and start creating a gel before they become a polymer, uh, they stay in a liquid phase for a very, very long time. And only at the very end, the liquid turns into a solid. So what happens is that normally when you polymerize, the cross-linking uh, uh, makes that your polymer starts shrinking bit by bit. In our case, that maybe happens also, but because it's liquid, the liquid keeps on refilling the shrinking part. And so actually we do not build in stress. We have no measurable shrinkage actually. And because we have no measurable, no measurable shrinkage and no stress, we'll be able to fill very, very tiny um, uh, cavities and they will, they will polymerize without shrinking. And also we'll be able to combine uh, very large structures with very small structures. Yeah? So we create centimeter large pieces with nanometer features. And these nanometer features, they are not destroyed during the, the polymerization because normally they would be, through the shrinking, they would be ripped out of the mold. In our case, that's not the case because we have this delay today. So we get a very nice, uh, replication with low defectivity, high aspect ratio, rapid replication, 
Uh, so it's a very nice polymer to work with on if you want a nanostructure. This is a closer view on the nano imprint lithography, where you see that we put a droplet of the material and then put our stamp on top, do a UV uh, exposure and remove the stamp. And in that way, we are able to um, create very nice structures. And here you see, for example, polymer, uh, um, pillar forests with pillars as small as 100 nanometer diameter, but 700 nanometer high, so they're high aspect ratio pillars, standing very dense next to each other. This is unique because if you try to do that with other technology, what you typically what you typically get is that these polymers will stick to each other; they will collapse. But in our case, that's not the case because we can replicate them and we can make them stiff enough. Here you see the inverted structure. That means an array of holes. These holes are 17 nanometer in diameter, but they're as deep as um, uh, more than uh, almost one and a half micrometer deep. And what we see here is what happens if you have a pillar forest and you grow cells on it. In this case, these are hepatocytes or liver cells. And you can see that is very important. Here you can see that the cell really likes the surface. It grows where we have the nanopillars. It does not grow where we do not have the nanopillars. So this shows that this kind of nanostructures are very important when you want to make biologic, when you want to test biologic structures. Also, the size of the, the, the small scale is important. So on the top here, you see pillars of 500 nanometer and at the bottom pillars of one micrometer. And we can see that the cells behave totally different on this. It's, you would think that they behave the same, but it's not. So on the 500 nanometer pillars, you see that where the cell interacts, it creates a lot of actin when it's, when it's in contact with the pillars. You can also see there's a very high contact. It's pooling really on the pillars. Whereas where we have a one micrometer, we don't have that effect. We have no or very little actin uh, expression. Now, to bring this type of um, polymer fabrication to its extreme, or we should, uh, we want to use uh, injection molding because injection molding is the standard way of structuring polymers in our world. And so we make uh, a mold consists consist of two parts with an insert in which we inject the polymer, UV cure it, and then open it up. And so we can see uh, using, we can do this process with very low packing pressure without clamping, uh, without needing, this is at room temperature, no temperature control, and it's a very rapid process. We have replication cycles of only 10 to 10 tens of seconds to maybe a minute or two minutes. So we have a very rapid replication. And we get very beautiful structures. Here you see, for example, uh, a structure that is a glass slide format. So this is structure is seven and a half centimeter on two and a half centimeter. It's a microdic structure. And we can see when you zoom in, we have integrated nano features just to be able to demonstrate how well we can do this. So if we zoom in, we can see we have, for example, pillars here that are only 250 nanometer in diameter, but one and a half micrometer high and honeycomb structures where the walls are as thin as 100 nanometer, but the holes are one micrometer thick, uh, deep. So we combine really this very low nanometer structures with the centimeter scale structures in an injection molding process. This is unique. You cannot do that in any other way. And here you see, for example, an AF image of pillars as small as 50 nanometers. We can do this with stiff polymer, as you could see here. This is a stiff polymer. We can also do it with soft polymer. Uh, so here you see the soft version of the polymer. And if you do that, then you see that your uh, pillar forest, they will, we can do uh, what we call a uh, controlled collapse. They will collapse into nano bristles, or when we have walls that stand up, they will collapse and form actually nano channels. <laughs> Here's a two walls collapse onto each other and we create nano channels in polymer. So here we show that we can play around with both stiff and soft polymers and create different structures in that way. Because we can do this on a nanoscale, we can uh, injection mold color. Uh, so if we make, for example, structures with a uh, half pitch of 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer, we can regenerate different colors because the visible light will interact. So we can make structural color of the structures. In the last part of this talk, I will focus on our work on the uh, nanostructuring of spider silk in the form of nanowires and nanomembranes. Let's start with watching a movie as an introduction. <laughs>
So we use recombinant spider silk, which means that uh, this is uh, sp uh, spider silk generated by, expressed by E. coli. Um, this is a collaboration with a group, by the way, with a group from Murheid Hammer at the, uh, the chemistry, biochemistry school at uh, KTH. So they extract the DNA from spiders, express the E. coli, and then uh, up concentrate it. And we start with a little vial of um, spider silk protein or spidroins in solution. And starting from this liquid, we try to create structured uh, spider silk. We can take a wild type, but we can also uh, functionalize DNA before we express it. So we create silk that has, for example, fibronectin domains that will stimulate cell growth, or silk with a Z domain that will bind antibodies. Silk has a property that, in contact with air, with a, actually with any hydrophobic surface, it will self-assemble into a, spill, a, a silk film. And so here we use that we put a standing solution of the silk as a stand for a couple of hours, and then we create a nanomembrane on top of a standing solution. And this is nanomembrane is typically 200 to 500 nanometer thick, and you can see it consists of this very tiny fibrils of silk. You can see them in an AFM. So the silk forms small fibrils, these fibrils together form a mesh that forms a membrane. And we developed the technology to be able to, uh, with a small cup, press down into this membrane so that the membrane conforms to that cup and then we can turn it and then pull it off and then we can transfer this silk membrane to the cup. And so we have centimeter sized membranes in area, but only 200 to 500 nanometer thick. And with that, we play around. You can see that it's very, very strong. So here you see, for example, there's a membrane here on the bottom of this cup. It's seven millimeter wide. And we have loaded it here with uh, steel bullets. Every bullet here is 20 milligram and you can count as maybe six, seven. So there's 140 milligram of weight pulling down on this tiny membrane without it breaking. You can see how we with a, even with a plunger can push it out or we can blow it up uh, as an actuator, as a balloon actuator, this very tiny silk film. We can, we can handle it, uh, it's quite sturdy. So, but of course, the interesting part is what we can do with it in terms of cell growth. Here you can see what happens if we grow keratinocytes, which are skin cells on such a membrane. We see after a couple of days already, after three days, we get a very nice confluent layer of cells, both on both sides. We can choose which side we grow on. Uh, we presented these uh, results in advanced functional materials uh, last year only, so you can find more information there. Um, we also looked at uh, what goes through these membranes, and then we see that, uh, of course, nanoparticles and microparticles are stopped by the membrane, but any protein we tested goes straight through. So that's very interesting for cell growth, of course, and specifically for cell co-culture. So we can grow... Um, um, endothelial cells on one side and turn around and then grow smooth muscle cells on the other side and then we get a co-culture of these two cell types and that actually is a model for a blood vessel. So we look at blood vessels, that's how they look like and if you look at some, one part here you can see an SEM image of a cross-section where here you see the silk membrane, the endothelial cells forming a very, very deep form pancakes and very, very thin pancake layer on top and the smooth muscle cells grow really and form a thick layer and very interestingly they create their own ECM. So you can see this little fiber here, this extracellular matrix uh, produced by the cells themselves. Yeah? And so we show, for example, that uh, on, you only have silk, the proteins go straight through IgG in this case, goes straight through. But silk, it still goes through. But if we have both layers, the ECM that is created here, it really forms a, a, um, a blockage for the proteins. And that shows that this is a biologically relevant model of, uh, for example, of a blood vessel. These results have been published in uh, this year in uh, ACS Biomaterial Science Engineering. Uh, as you saw in the movie already, we also make nanowires out of the silk. We do that by rolling a droplet. And you can see as the droplet rolls, actually it leaves a film behind it and this film then collapses into a uh, into nanowires. And here you can see what happens if we do that very slowly. If we let the droplet stand, you get an idea of how that looks like. So you see as a droplet evaporates in this case, it pulls back and then you see how the membranes here collapse into to form nanowires eventually. Okay. Now we do that not only by, this is just what happens if we just put a droplet and let it stand and then we can film what happens. But to do this in controlled fashion, what we do is that we actually Sorry, we roll the droplet in a rapid fashion 
and then we create the nanowires that are very controllable. And here you see a zoom in. So this is part of this pillar. And here you see the, the, the nanowire. You can see it's really the membrane that has whoosh, uh, like rolled up into form a nanowire. And the thickness, so the length of these nanowires is typically 10, 20 micrometer. The diameter is 200, 300 nanometer. And here what happens if you put beads in the solution and you can create uh, capture little beads in these nanowires. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, we're looking into uh, commercializing this, so we work together with the company Spiber, and here we do that in a robotic setup where you see how the droplet of spider silk solution is pulled over the surface with, with super hydrophobic uh, silicon pillars, and these pillars, so it goes up and down, and within uh, 15 minutes we create typically 2 million wires. This is a view on how this looks like, very nice uh, wires, all with the same diameter. And this is published in uh, Advanced Materials in 2018, this technology actually. Uh, we can also measure these wires uh, under using an AFM tool under an SEM, and you can see that we can measure, for example, how strong they are. And of course, we are looking into using these wires either to, uh, to use them in gel to, to stimulate cell growth or for smart drug delivery. You can see just one example what happens if you grow uh, human neurons and you can see how nicely this uh, accents are the the, the 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 human neurons will extend their accents and we can guide them along these the size the fiber wires so it was just a nice example of what we can do so this is the end of my talk uh, i hope you enjoyed it i showed three different types of nanostructure we do in our lab and hopefully yeah now it's time for questions I would also, of course, like to thank the sponsor, which is Spiber, uh, uh, the company for interest in spiders, Silk, and the European Union. Thank you very much.